issues, it seems to me that we need to be funding also in other places. And, and maybe some of that doesn't make a to create funding that, that, that you referenced. But well, we, we are right now uh, looking at developing a more comprehensive proposal uh, to sit down and discuss with the governor. I've been uh, working very closely uh, with Commissioner Fitzpatrick and the Department of Corrections uh, based upon certainly their experience at the new unit at Main State Prison, how that relates to the system for forensics, uh, and looking at whether or not we need to be preparing a more comprehensive proposal. That, as, as you know, a lot of the discussion here has been about uh, the the opportunity for individuals to timely and appropriately access inpatient care and to be uh, timely discharged. And so for the civil side of the equation, we know that hospitals are struggling with individuals who are in their emergency departments unable to timely access an inpatient bed. So Riverview's inability to support that need for longer term inpatient care for civil uh, certainly is something that we need to be focused on and so changes that would alleviate some of the pressure in Riverview that currently is as a result of forensic patients will hopefully also open up the opportunity to better meet the needs of civil patients throughout the system both at uh, Riverview certainly at Dorothea Dix the two private psychiatric hospitals Acadia and Spring Harbor and then all of the community hospitals as well but they're not you're right a long-winded answer, or just a, though that initiative is not included in the budget as we continue to look at uh, where, uh, what needs to be the larger uh, proposal for consideration by the legislature. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Um, good afternoon, Commissioner. I have a question, um, and it has to do with uh, recertification. Has your budget been built uh, with the assumption that recertification of Riverview will take place? So our budget is still uh, based on drawing down the disproportionate share funds. Uh, clearly, as we described to the legislature when we presented testimony last January and February, and in fact, I believe we included a request for funds to replace uh, those DISH funds with general fund uh, in the event that uh, ultimately we, we lose this um, debate with the federal government. Uh, this is complicated, as you know. Uh, there is a difference between our, my view, there is a difference between uh, our eligibility for certification under Medicare and Medicaid, which is a licensing uh, issue, and a state's ability to use disproportionate share funds. Uh, states have long had great flexibility in uh, designating which hospitals and facilities are eligible for disproportionate share funding. It's also a different side of the house within CMS that oversees DISH and DISH audits. So uh, we know that uh, we've, we've long had concerns about a DISH audit for a different reason, which relates to the uh, use of those funds for our forensic clients. The other issue about whether or not a facility has to be certified in order to uh, receive DISH is another issue that we will likely continue to uh, discuss with the federal government as to whether or not we agree. So today, this budget is still uh, based on receipt of disproportionate share funding to help support Riverview. Thank you. You're welcome. Are you ready to get off stage? I think you have another question. I've been doing so, this since so 10, though. So. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If it's following up on uh, Representative Rotunda's question, I thought I had understood that, and I understand it's maybe not completely tied to research, but it's a certification, but that we had lost that funding and we're not currently receiving it. That's not no, we, uh, I know it's tough sometimes with how things get reported, uh, but we have not <coughs> lost the federal DISH funding. Uh, we are at great risk of losing the federal DISH, disproportionate share hospital funding. Um, but they have not taken the federal funds at this time. 
and if CMS Medicaid side of the house were to do that, there is then an appeal process uh, that would be separate and apart from the litigation that we are involved in related to the licensing and certification of Riverview with the federal government. I know it's as clear as mud. Um, we'll prepare a handy dandy uh, fact, sheet, fact sheet on this to uh, help with all the background. Representative thank you very much. But if we're assuming $20 million a year over the course of, say, three years, right? Yeah, a little yeah. less than, a little less than 20. So it's $50 million, give or take, over three, three years. Is that, if they decide not to, if we end up losing everything, we're liable to pay that there? Absolutely, which is why we came in last year and requested uh, general fund dollars to replace the DISH funding, uh, and that we were at risk for that. Okay, thank you. Okay, so you're well to yes, no? That was no. my question. Okay. <laughs> you got one more? No. No? Okay. You ready to be off stage? But uh, Mark, in the last call here. Well, I need to figure out. You, the legislature last time replaced the potential loss. No, did or, not. Or yes. what money did they put in? No, for for dish, okay. the decision was we will wait for the outcome. And that's the pending lawsuit. Nope. Uh, well, it could be both, uh, and this is why I'm, tr I'm trying to explain. There is certainly a current uh, litigation around the decision to decertify Riverview. Uh, that side of the house within CMS is arguing that uh, decertification is linked to an entity's ability to uh, draw down federal disproportionate share. So the lawsuit is for what purpose? The lawsuit is to argue that we should never have been decertified, which would certainly address uh, the disproportionate share funding. Okay, so so the lawsuit has nothing to do, well, it doesn't, it doesn't about money, it's a decertification. It's about decertification. Which then could lead to money if we were decertified. It could. I'd like to think that there's yet another appeal process related right. to that, because I'm just gonna, this is just, this is my uh, argument, and. Disproportionate share funding, there are two categories of disproportionate share funding. One is for community hospitals. The other is for uh, what the federal government has long uh, uh, labeled as institutions for mental disease. So it is DISH, I-M-D, funding. An institution for mental disease is not necessarily a hospital. It can be a facility with 16 or more beds that is primarily serving the needs of individuals with mental illness. So I'd like to argue that there is greater flexibility for those DISH funds that do not necessarily have to be supporting a certified hospital. Gotcha. Thank you. And Senator Haskell? Yes? There's just one more item. Just one? Oh, one more item. Uh, Representative Stuckey. You've been quiet all day. <laughs> uh, I want to ask a, a little bit about the uh, FMAP situation. Now, it, it, the uh, changes in the rates are based on a uh, federal formula that compares Maine relative to the other states. On our per capita income relative, yes. So that if our FMAP rate goes up, would that indicate that relative to the rest of the states, our per capita income is lower? Yes. For so that for that point in time, yeah, is on that lag. On that lag. The data is, is based upon a two to three mm -hmm. year lag. Okay. So if we're, if that's in fact the, what's the, the going on, why are we trying to reduce programs to a national average if in fact our population is lower, the, the, the income is lower than the national average? Wouldn't that mean that if we were, if the feds were gonna give us that difference, that differential, 
but the sort of the intended purpose would be to use that additional funding to try to level the playing field in terms of the, the lag with our uh, uh, income. I guess I don't um, see the F map as being a uh, indicator of, of how a state should manage its resources. And our focus is on how to move people out of poverty, how to uh, develop pathways that are about economic mobility and revitalizing the economy so that we are attracting better paying jobs with benefits into the state rather than we need to uh, put more money into these programs because of, of being a poor state. We'd like to change that equation and help to support uh, people out of poverty. Yeah, no, I'm thinking of people who perhaps uh, their employment days are behind them. With the MSP and Dell and things like that, where it, it would seem to me that there's a, a the, the federal government, I don't think it's telling us what to do. I think they're providing us an opportunity. It's just, it's just a curiosity for me why, when we have that opportunity, we wouldn't be looking at, at uh, ways to may help maintain uh, a, a quality of life for folks who have worked hard all their lives. I think we are. I think that's why we're proposing many of the initiatives to fund uh, some of the programs around the uh, elderly uh, waivers, the home-based care. Uh, we are looking as well at the flexibility among several of our federal block grants to maximize services and supports related to housing, transportation, employment, and services along with uh, additional funding and support for uh, some of the home-based care for the elderly. I agree. Did you have one? I, I'm going to turn it over to Alec and have him summarize that last initiative. Yeah, if you look at the bottom of the initiative page, you'll note that there's another 12 million. Okay. Um, that's just capturing the rest of the initiatives that we have. To give you an example of what some of those are, in FY 2014, $2 million for the first out of the department's budget. Our understanding was that that would only be for FY 2014. It was applied then to FY 2015, and therefore applied going forward in this baseline. That was in error, um, so the budget office recommended that we submit an initiative for those $2 million to be restored to the budget. That would have otherwise been the baseline. We were instructed that we needed to submit an initiative there. Um, if you look at the GA savings that the commissioner discussed, that $5.4 million within that initiative, we note that if the legislature approves that initiative, we would take that funding and put it forward to Section 21 waitlist needs. So it ties back to that initiative request. Um, we had to include that as a separate part of the initiative in our ask. So that is part of the $12.6 million, 12, yeah, 12.6 round for both years. Um, and that would be 5.4 for each year of the biennium. Um, another number in there, just another larger one of interest, is replacing other special revenue funds that when the uh, revenue forecast committee came back with their latest results, we were down $2 million that we need to replace with general fund dollars, which is some of the key catch in that category. Okay. Thank you. Senator, I think that concludes our high-level overview of the department and a briefing on the budget initiatives. We look forward to we look forward to coming back to answer more questions and providing more information, but I think you have one more question. I won't, I won't deny the co-chair. <laughs> Thank you. It's not, it's not really a, um, uh, a question. Uh, we, we're pleased, Commissioner, that you will be coming back to, to answer questions. And thank you for the preparation of the additional information you will send us. I don't know when we might expect it, but I know I, for example, have other questions that I didn't ask. Some of them are more technical in terms of understanding eligibility, et cetera. Um, and when, when might we expect that additional information to see if maybe some of these questions that I know I have have already been answered by the department? We don't have a specific date, but I am trying to get this as, as soon as possible to all of you so that you have it in advance of your budget deliberations and have an opportunity to reflect on it as you begin uh, the process of getting here. 
something. So I, I would hope within a matter of a week or more we'd be able to get those over here. Thank you. Um, we had talked on appropriations about sending to departments questions that we had. Um, and maybe we can, you know, if there are additional questions that people have that didn't get asked today, we'll be sending them along. And, and um, if, if the sheets address them, that's great. And if they don't, then you know, I know we'll find answers for us. And I just have to say, as a member of the Appropriations Committee from the last session, having, I think, at 3 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> figured out a way to provide the funding for the wait list and the additional funding for nursing homes, I am thrilled that the administration is embracing um, those initiatives uh, because we work very hard on appropriations to come up with that funding, to find that money, because we did feel it was so important to take people off the wait list and to provide additional funding for nursing homes. So that, as I said, I'm, I'm pleased to see that you've embraced that in your budget. Thank you. Yeah, we've had a long-standing commitment to addressing those challenges. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Thank you all of the DHHS staff that showed up today. Appreciate that. Um, committee, we will recess for the next seven minutes, get a chance to reset for a little bit, and be back on 4 o'clock.